Good afternoon. It's Friday the 26th of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me today in the studio, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the pro programme, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Um, well, Patrick, we're going to start off with, uh, well, 500,000 very naughty people, apparently. And, uh, well, we'll come, be coming on to that figure of 500,000 a little bit later as well. Significant number for some reason. But uh, the Sun here is saying that uh, lockdown warning, PM warns, of new lockdown after more than 500,000 people swarm to beaches on hottest day of the year. Uh, and uh, well, Tobias Elwood was the main man complaining about this uh, because he, he got onto Twitter to uh, vent his outrage. Uh, and then Matt Hancock uh, decided he would uh, talk about it as well uh, on, uh, on talk radio uh, saying, you know, this is really inappropriate. Uh, so lots of people enjoying themselves, lots of social distancing going on there. Of course. And what do you expect an Englishman to do when in the hottest day of summer rolls around, Mike? Stay indoors? Well, indeed. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't end terribly well uh, with lots of images of uh, this type of thing being left behind. I think that's a little bit sad uh, and probably the only uh, wrongdoing there. But anyway, Matt Hancock, uh, for his part, said this. Uh, we do have the power to shut down beaches, but he's reluctant to use it. Um, so there you go. Uh, Chris Whitty then, uh, he weighed in. Uh, he said uh, COVID-19 has gone down uh, due to the efforts of everyone, but it's still in general circulation. Uh, if we do not follow social distancing guidance, then cases will rise again. Naturally, people will want to enjoy the sun, but we need to do so in a way that is safe for all. Uh, now, this is a, a very important point because, of course, he's focusing on this idea of cases, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but the uh, the local uh, Bournemouth councillor here, Vicky Slade, said, we're absolutely appalled at the scenes witnessed on our beaches. The irresponsible behaviour and actions of so many people is just shocking. We've had no choice now but declare, to declare a major incident and initiate an emergency response. So there you go. That's what she had to say. Funny they didn't say that after the uh, Black Lives Matter protests a couple of weeks ago, Mike. There wasn't an emergency response for that. No, uh, but of course, uh, what's this all doing, Patrick? It's, it's bringing us back towards this notion of a second wave coming. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's bring uh, this guy on screen. This is uh, Hans Klug, uh, who's from the World Health Organization. Uh, and he's very concerned about the resurgence in, uh, the, in Europe as a whole. Uh, he said, last week, Europe saw an increase in the weekly cases for the first time in months. For weeks, I've spoken about the risk of resurgence as countries adjust measures. So again, we're seeing this pressure building to, to reverse or to stop or at least delay the release from locked up from lockup uh, that we've seen. Uh, so he went on to say this. Uh, in several countries across Europe, the, com the risk has now become a reality. 30 countries have seen increases in new cumulative cases over the past two weeks. Um, so uh, this, of course, uh, uh, highlighted here. Uh, sorry, last week we saw this from the Daily Mail. Uh, is COVID-19 becoming less potent? Uh, Italian doctors say the coronavirus is weaker than it was during the height of the pandemic. So we've got this mixed message once again, Patrick, from the World Health Organization saying we're, we're seeing a resurgence. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing headlines like that. Now, in fact, that was uh, a pretty, that was a bit of fake news. Uh, this Mail Online article here from last week. Uh, this is the uh, Italian doctor uh, who made the comment, Professor Alberto Zangrillo. Now, he's uh, quite a senior uh, scientist, doctor, uh, he's vastly published 800 publications, 350 papers uh, indexed, cited more than 8,000 times. Uh, he's a credible person, but this is the point that he was making. Coronavirus is no longer, no longer clinically exists. He doesn't say, he's not saying that the virus has disappeared. He's not saying the virus is weaker than it was uh, for the, the, the demographic that's susceptible to serious complications from it. He's saying that it's no longer clinically exists. This is very important. Now, uh, after that mail article, uh, we had uh, headlines such as this, expert reaction to comments reported in the media by Professor Alberto Zangrillo uh, about the COVID-19 virus in Italy and various comments about not being able to see data and, and so on. But the efforts going on to try to discredit what he was saying. Um, but this is uh, really the point of, that he was making. Uh, those who are lucky enough to be able, as he is, because he's head of uh, the ICU units in, in Milan 
he was lucky enough to be able to study the data of 6,000 patients. And he's saying he has a duty to communicate in an exact and timely matter, manner uh, what he witnessed. And what he witnessed was basically this, uh, that the, as far as he's concerned, all the prerequisites for being confident about being able to deal with any resurgence, uh, the most of, important of which we're fighting a known enemy, this time without being found unprepared. So this was his key point, that from a clinical point of view, the virus no longer exists because they're now fighting a known enemy. They now know how to deal with it. They now know which demographics are affected the worst by it. And they know how now how to uh, make sure that people don't get into a position where they need to be intubated on, on ventilators. So the Daily Mail article was a misrepresentation of, of what he was saying. And, and uh, you see this focus on cases in the media, Mike, cases. All the second waivers are pushing this idea of cases. Even Chris Witte, he's saying that cases might spike. It's still in general circulation. First of all, uh, cases don't necessarily translate to the death toll. And with more testing, of course, there's going to be more cases. The question is, who are the cases affecting? Who is the most seriously affected within that demographic which you pointed out? The other thing is the idea that being outdoors, Mike, is somehow dangerous and that there'll be like a scourge of coronavirus uh, uh, infections and fatalities because people are going to the beach. Being outdoors on a hot summer day is probably the safest place in the world you could be if you didn't want to catch the coronavirus. So it, the, all of these points, important common sense points are left out of the dialogue. So the, so the point here being that this uh, outrage in the press about 500,000 people appearing on the beaches it's reinforcing this notion of a resurgence, of it coming back for a second wave. And the question is, what happens this coming wave? Because they, they need to develop this, if we're correct about what's going on here, they need to develop this narrative as we come into the autumn uh, and into the, the flu season for this year, because then we'll have a mixture of COVID-19, influenza, uh, pneumonia. How are we going to differentiate between these? We're going to see more excess mortality. How are we going to know what the cause of this excess mortality is? Let's put the excess mortality graph uh, back on screen here, uh, Patrick, because uh, now this hasn't been updated since the 10th of this month. But the point here is this red shaded area on this graph, we are labeling as lockdown deaths because if uh, Alberto Zangrillo is saying that they are now prepared I question whether Britain is prepared, any more prepared than we were six months ago. Because if we look at what actually happened, um, these excess, this excess mortality that's on screen at the moment, this wasn't caused by, by the fact that this was a novel uh, disease or through not being prepared. This was caused by the intentional shutdown of all normal medical services, with the exception of kidney dialysis and COVID-19, because the NHS from a policy perspective was reoriented onto COVID-19 to the exclusion of absolutely everything else. Uh, and more than that, it was caused by nursing homes not having emergency support being made available, by blanket do not resuscitate orders in place, and by infected people being sent back to nursing homes from hospitals uh, while there was no emergency support and with do, do not resuscitate orders being in place. So those deaths that are on screen at the moment, that excess mortality, is caused by policy, not by unpreparedness. And it's still going on right now as we speak. The COVID wards are still being given priority. We've spoken to people recently. This is a reality. How many people, uh, people with heart conditions, people who are uh, candidates for a stroke, uh, early stage cancer, not being screened, not being treated. This is in the millions, Mike. This is a mass, that, that is an epidemic of giant proportions that's not being really addressed and all, all, we're still asked to sort of clap for the NHS uh, on, uh, every Thursday night. But what, what is the, the NHS has a backlog of how many hundreds of thousands, millions potentially of appointments? Are they ever going to catch up no. on that backlog? No, and, the, and that's pretty much acknowledged now. They're not going to catch up on that. That is the true disaster of this COVID crisis. Um, absolutely. Um, so uh, let's move on to this then. Uh, the BBC saying, Coronavirus UK councils fear bankruptcy amid COVID-19 costs. Well, where do those costs come from? We'll get to that in a minute, Mike. But this is what they're saying, that some of the UK's largest unitary authorities, including Leeds, Wiltshire, Trafford, uh, Thameside and Barnett, 
are basically facing bankruptcy uh, because of a shortfall in their budgets. Uh, Liverpool's mayor, uh, Joe Anderson, previously warned that the city may issue a Section 114 notice. That's the equivalent to Chapter 11, I mm -hmm. guess, uh, in American terms. But the authority now planning to revise their budget uh, to address a uh, 50, 58.6 million pound shortfall. And they go on to just say Birmingham is one of the biggest local authorities uh, in Europe uh, forecasting a shortfall of 212 million uh, over the next two years. That's after a 70 million government uh, funding uh, tranche already received. So a section 114 notice would not rectify this situation. Mm -hmm. So what do we have here? Uh, essentially, we have a situation, Mike, where you know most many of the local authorities around the country um, are predicting budget shortfalls. They're blaming this on COVID. Okay, so presumably, I'm trying to figure out where where they would be the, the shortfall in their budget would be, Mike. Because are they not collecting council tax, or certainly all of these bills should be. Paid. I don't see how this is possible. Uh, well, it is true that that uh, the uh, bill of the operation of bailiffs was stopped over the last several months to stop uh, people that were falling behind with council tax, stop that mo money being uh, collected by bailiffs. Uh, that situation is coming to end to an end, and bailiffs are starting to be able to operate again now. Um, but nonetheless, th these are good questions. I would suggest that if we look behind the headlines there, we'll find that those budget shortfalls uh, were in existence already to some degree. They may have been exacerbated slightly by what's going on, but not significantly. You remember the 2008 financial crisis, Mike, where some of the councils were caught stuffing their money in some of these high-risk uh, hedge funds in places like Iceland. Mm. Uh, and so they have these gold-plated pension and uh, retirement schemes for employees, public sector pensions. Uh, where Where is all the money? I mean, this is another question. That, that could come out later, that maybe the money isn't where it should be. And well, it's, that, that, yeah. it's, it's sitting in some hedge fund somewhere. Uh, absolutely. Um, okay, now if you like what the UK Column's doing and you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there, and that would be very much appreciated. Uh, but Patrick, uh, one of the things we've been talking about for a while is the new abnormal uh, so uh, what's the latest? The latest, there's there's no end to the new abnormal. We're calling it the new abnormal now. So if you hear the term new normal, you want to change that, alter that slightly. We're calling it the new abnormal. Let's look at uh, some of the most, uh, well, here's the leader of of the, the campaign. This is Boris Johnson. He's got his thumb pressed neatly against his knuckle there. Let's get this done. Let's defeat COVID. I've got all his greatest hits here up on screen. <laughs> Uh, remember social distancing, stay alert, control the virus, save lives, protect the NHS, save lives. Two meters apart, don't shake hands, cover your mouth. Boris is absolutely determined to drive this thing home, Mike. And uh, the, the, the government propaganda is unbelievable. If you check their Twitter account, here's one of the latest ones. One solo or single parent household and one household of any size can visit each other's homes. Thank you very much. Mike, who is actually following any of these instructions because no one. I don't see anybody out no. there following any of these guidelines. It's almost comical, really, how this is becoming right now. Now, one of the biggest uh, things, Mike, is leisure, okay? Catering, hospitality, and leisure. And so the amount of guidelines that are being required for, let's say, pubs and restaurants to reopen on July 4th is just growing and growing and growing and all the social distancing technology they're wanting to implement and rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Let's look at how this is affecting one of the greatest institutions uh, in Britain, which is the pub, pub, okay? It's world famous. It's why people come here from all over the world. Most tourists want to go into a pub. Now, who is gonna wanna go into what we're about to show you right now? Let's take a look at this situation here. And uh, there's the pint sitting up at the bar. And this is something that was shared with uh, Simon Dolan on Twitter. Uh, go to Simon Dolan's Twitter account if you want to follow a lot of these issues closely with regards to business. This was from the West Norfolk licensing team guidelines for reopening. And this is, was to a local publican. One member of staff required to take a trace and track information from customers and restrict the number at the door. One member of staff required to monitor the toilets and clean in between customers. 
Okay, that's understandable. One member of staff designated as pub safe supervisor to monitor customers, social distancing, and general well-being. Now, just before you go on to the next tranche of three, if we go back to the first one there, one member of staff required to, track, to, to take trace and track information from customers. Um, that would be considered personal data. Oh, yes. This would fall under the Data Protection Act. Absolutely. It would. Uh, who is providing the pubs with the support, uh, the, the legal advice uh, to, to maintain these types of records? Yeah, well, uh, I have a slide for that in a minute. Okay. We'll, we'll show you. So the, the whole tracking and tracing and getting data from people coming in is just quite, that, that's, a, that's a new step forward. Yeah. Now, you've heard about the app, Mike, that some uh, people are uh, looking at downloading an app in order to pre-book their tables at pubs and restaurants. And then by that, they'll be registered or they'll be able to tap in as someone who's arrived. So this kind of idea of an, a real ID or a digital ID, this is, again, coming through the leisure sector, mm -hmm. the hospitality sector. This is how they wanted to uh, implement some of these technologies in the past, like uh, embedded microchips and stuff. They were mm -hmm. rolled out in high-end clubs in Spain and things like that. So let's look at what else they have to say from the uh, West Norfolk licensing team. Uh, we'll look at what else they've got planned here. One meter social distancing. There's caveats with masks uh, on that as well that we've heard from government. One-way system put in place. This is arrows on the ground, really treating you like you are a preschool student. And then no one seated at the bar. Well, it's not really a bar if no one can be seated at the bar, Mike. That means it's not a bar, is it? It's no, indeed. And if you're required to, to prepay for your, uh, for your beers through, the, through an app of some kind, then you can't even go to the bar and pay for your drinks. Yes, yeah. Well, I'll show you what's happening in Ireland in a minute. Table service only. There's a big hint. Yeah. So they will need to tr transform uh, the way service is done. Contactless payments, cashless society through the back door. And this one I loved. No quiz nights or live entertainment for the foreseeable future. What, why would live entertainment be banned? What does that have to do with the coronavirus? Well, singing into a mic may spray coronavirus all over the, all over the audience, well, perhaps. I'm sure I don't they know. could put a plexiglass <laughs> barrier between the musicians and the crowd. That's easily done. It's not quite chicken wire like in the Blues Brothers, but it might work. Quiz nights. How are quiz nights dangerous? You can social distance on quiz nights. Uh, maybe they're concerned about uh, coronavirus-related questions being asked and, <laughs> and, and, and dubious answers coming back or something. I don't know. Probably, probably. Well, here's one pub owner's response from uh, the West Norfolk uh, area here. He says, with the above restrictions and rules, the diminished footfall, we have taken the decision not to reopen for the foreseeable future as it would not be financially viable to do so. That's the reality for a lot of business owners, Mike. It's yeah. just not going to be financially feasible for them. And that's unfortunate. And this isn't because of the coronavirus, mind you. This is because of government-issued uh, guidelines and restrictions and police enforcing them. In fact, uh, the police in Brix Brixton had a kind of a, r a mini riot the other night. Mm. And the Lambeth police, Mike, I'll just say this real quickly, were on record as saying their role was to enforce the guidelines. They said this on record. So it, it's not... Since legal. when did they have a role? It, the law is that uh, they can't, but now they have a role to enforce guidelines. So it's now, a, what is a role? It's it's not the law. It's not, though it's fairly arbitrary, isn't it? Mm. So let's look at what uh, one, uh, just a legal note here for all pubs and restaurants taking details of customers. This is Francis Hoare. He's a barrister uh, and a accomplished lawyer in London. Uh, pubs and restaurants taking details will be guidance, Data Protection Act 2018 and GDPR are the law. Ignore the guidance, mm. he says. This is a barrister uh, in the chambers in London. So that's interesting, isn't it? Now, Ireland, what is going on in Ireland, Mike? They're taking this on with a new level of enthusiasm that even trumps the British. And I can't for the life of me figure out how and why. Some people might blame their EU status, possibly. But pubs will be required to take contact details of drinkers when they open on June 29th. But that's not all. There's going to be a time limit that you could spend inside the pub. Let's look at some of the uh, rules and regulations here from uh, Public Health Ireland. Pubs to operate like restaurants. Everybody must be seated, offered table service. Meals would be uh, reasonably cost at nine euros, uh, must be sold to each customer. So 
I, I, I believe there's this uh, push, Mike, because of the time limit allowed in the pub uh, in terms of how big the meal that you could have. So they're wanting to keep the meals small and short. But the, the idea that they're setting pricing guidelines, the government, um, this is bizarre. I don't know exactly Amazing. what this is, but they go on here and the limiting patrons to just 90 minutes inside the premises. Uh, although this was raised by 15 minutes to 105 minutes uh, after lobbying of the health chiefs uh, from the industry body there in Ireland, Mike. So from 90 minutes to 105 minutes. So you are you now have to, what, take a ticket and take your seat and th it's like going to the swimming pool or something. You've got you've got a, a, timer. a timer. Maybe there'll be a timer on the on, on the table. So, but they go on. It it, it gets even better here. Uh, this is where it does get slightly bizarre. When patrons leave the pub or the restaurant, uh, the area they occupied must be left vacant for at least fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. So, COVID needs time to to rest or time to leave. Um, I don't know. They want to make sure you can't go. New customers can't go to the old table. Right. Well, well. Now, if you put think this uh, about this in the terms of the uh, of the uh, track and trace apps, right? Uh, you are considered to have come into contact with someone if you have if your mobile phone has noticed being beside somebody else's mobile phone for fifteen minutes or more. Uh, that's why. That must. That, that's that's the reason for it. So there there, there is making app sure there's separation between people for the apps. Uh, so th they're not talking about the apps, but the apps they have in mind, don't they, mm. with these guidelines. So customers must be seated at the table except when using the toilet, paying or departing. So you can't stand up in the pub and like go over to another table and say, all right, how are you doing? Hey, do you want drinks? You got no, that's, right. that's already made me clear. You're not allowed to, if you, know, if you see somebody across the pub that you know you're not allowed to wave at them, shout at them, talk to them, you can't, you've got to ignore them. Yeah, definitely don't shout at them. Don't raise your voice. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting detail, Mike. Decoration of drinks, i.e. cocktail umbrellas, should be minimized. Mm. So very important detail there in terms of health and safety with the coronavirus. So the question, Mike, we're going to ask is, what's going on in the UK and Ireland? Why are they so vastly different than the rest of, of Europe? And it doesn't, you know, the, the point is it, it, life doesn't have to be a social distancing hell um, of of arrows and restrictions because there's other European countries, Mike, that are just resuming life as normal and nothing, no disasters happening. There's not a genocide. Let's uh, take a look at one a gentleman, John Kirby, uh, who we follow on Twitter, and he's got a video, Mike, from Stockholm, uh, just filmed a couple of days ago, and you know, he just went out, took a quick video on his cell phone. Let's take a look at John's video here. Hi, welcome to Sweden. This is Thursday the 25th of June 2020. I just want to show you uh, how normal we are in Sweden. Enjoy. As you can see, people are normal, sitting close, no masks, none of this craziness you're being told here and this is in Stockholm we're in a, uh, a street in the, uh, in the south of Stockholm uh, called Hornsgarten which is uh, yeah, the south of the city um, and as you can see everybody's very normal um, carry on a little bit further it's just a Short Street, unfortunately, uh, it's been uh, our uh, midsummer. Well, not unfortunately for this, but uh, it's been our midsummer, which uh, is a big celebration, bigger than Christmas here in, in Sweden. And many people have left the city to go into their summer houses. Um, but uh, so there's not as many people as normally. But uh, I thought this, uh, this video was good to show you that. Uh, we don't have any uh, abnormal here in Sweden. Uh, everybody is uh, living as before. Whatever, well, of course, there's a few people still afraid, um, but most of us are back to normal. I hope you enjoyed. 
Somebody in the chat box there, Patrick, saying the science must be different in different countries. I, I, corona just is different as well. Corona mm -hmm. behaves different. I didn't see any stickers, any child stickers on the sidewalk, Mike. I didn't see any stencil spray painting, mm -hmm. COVID keep your distance signs. I didn't see any masks. I saw old people walking around with no masks. Uh, people were just, life is normal. Matt, what would Matt Hancock say? This must be a horrifying scene for Matt Hancock. I mean, what would he think? With the, about the Swedes. Well, that certainly does think, but anyway. It, it doesn't get any better uh, when we look at the club scene, Mike, and I'm going to show you a disturbing video, so we're going to preference this. Uh, do look away if you are easily traumatized by very disturbing scenes. We're going we're gonna to show this right now, so again, uh, adults, uh, use your discretion if there are children around. Mike, this is, well, this is clubbing in COVID land. Uh, I know this is unbelievable and you're probably thinking this is some kind of a spoof, but it's not, this, this really happened. So this is the Daily Mail pushing, yeah. pushing this out, so, so this actually happened. Yes, this was via Reuters, so you can see the DJ up there. And look at the punters, uh, they're spaced apart, they're sitting in chairs. So this was a clubbing open in the afternoon because the late night's not really safe because uh, of the corona, so this is happening during the day. Doesn't this look like a real great shindig, Mike? I mean, uh. how much fun would this be? And you're probably asking yourself, who would go for such a thing? What sort of a population would be this conformist? And, uh, and, and, and really just, I mean, you should be rubbishing this if you're a musician or a DJ or anybody. This is in the Netherlands. Uh. So <laughs> they're just test running this new club concept here. This is COVID clubbing. But we're going to replace the acid house smiley face, Mike, with Caroni's back. He's running the show, but he's still a little bit confused. You see them tapping their feet on the ground. Everybody's seated. How much fun is this, Mike? I mean, in terms of a rave, I Just mean, brilliant. the kids have so much to look forward to. So again, Caroni is very active in the clubs, apparently. Not as active in other places, in, you know, supermarkets yeah. and... Uh, at uh, social justice protests, but there they are. They're moving in a new group there. He's found his seat. Isn't that it's a fantastic? I'm sure they probably have time limits on that as well. Yes, it, actually, mean, there must be a limit to the amount of time that you could possibly have that much fun. There is. It's about it's about one hour. It's about one hour. So you're allowed to come in, sit down in the chair, bop around a little bit. You see, she's shaking it there, and uh, that's it. And so much fun, isn't this? Yeah, fantastic. Let's, let's go to the Netherlands for a clubbing holiday. It looks like great fun. And she's tapping their feet there. I mean, this is just, it's heartwarming, isn't it? And Caroni is also, you know, he's getting in the act as well. He's dancing a bit on the side. It doesn't get any better than that, Mike. It really doesn't. So the, the point is, let's, <laughs> let's look, let's get back to reality, okay? And some Swedish statistics have just come through. So the point is, Mortality in perspective, 85% of COVID deaths have a pre-existing condition, 90% are over 70, 48% are from care homes, 26% uh, more have home help. So, and one death under 20, yet uh, compulsory schooling never closed. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality in Sweden. So what's the verdict of this? The verdict is the general population has never been at any serious risk for being hospitalized for COVID. That's the conclusion we draw from this data. And just for those who are, you know, anti-Viking haters uh, who don't like Sweden because of all the propaganda that's been coming out, let's look at some comparable data from the NHS. This is just from this week. This is downloaded from the NHS's spreadsheets uh, for daily deaths. So let's look at some of the conclusions that we found from this data. It's very much the same as Sweden. 95% of deaths have a pre-existing condition. Average age, over 80. 91% of the deaths, over 60. And uh, only 1% under 40, excluding those with pre-existing conditions, of course. So only one death under 80 this past week. Four deaths under 20, 37 deaths under 40. Uh, 298 deaths under 60. It's a country of 60 plus million, Mike. Uh, but the, the big caveat we've got to put on this, Patrick, of course, is that these are deaths which are attributed to that none of these people had uh, post-mortem examinations. Good point. So yeah, we're not even going that deep, but just on the surface, just taking their data at face value, 
we're going to conclude this same conclusion. The general population has never been at any serious risk of being hospitalized for COVID. Mm -hmm. You have to look at things in perspective, in context, the size of the country, et cetera, Mike. So that's the reality there. And just if you didn't think this was the biggest PSYOP going, uh, I'm going to point to this. This is a pop-up store in Miami that's come up, I believe it's in the, one of the shopping malls of the airports. COVID-19 Essentials. They've got the designer masks there in the window. Very attractive. So anything you need for COVID or coping with COVID or any fashion accessories, you can see they've even got their own little caricature mic up there with the kind of one eye bigger than the other, the kind of Bessos look and the, the mouth open there. Uh, a little coroni of their own, sort of evil coroni. Uh, that's that's what they've got there. So this is an incredible psyop. Uh, if you look at how they're commercializing this, mm. what a gravy train this is. Absolutely. Now on this on the point of masks, we'll just quickly. Uh, many of you have already seen this graphic. Just a few pointers on face mask safety. Know the facts before you wear one. Decreased oxygen intake, increased toxin inhalation shuts down your immune system increases virus risk, scientifically inaccurate. Uh, virologists have actually measured COVID-19 to be, well, uh, a lot smaller than the fabric and uh, the protection that you have. So the idea that you're gonna keep the virus out is really a uh, canard. Effectiveness has not been studied. There's not been enough scientific peer-reviewed studies on masks, so how could you possibly be so certain about the policy? So that's the point on masks going forward. Question the science uh, that you're being fed uh, through the media and government. So another question is, what what is it that we're uh, relaunching the economy? What kind of re-economy are we relaunching? What is, what's the purpose of this relaunched economy? Well, let's uh, look at a couple of comments from a couple of diplomats from the UK. Uh, here's Laura Clark first. She's British High Commissioner to New Zealand. Um, and uh, so she was giving a speech uh, yesterday uh, and she said that the death and disruption caused by the novel coronavirus pandemic is unprecedented in her lifetime. It's a truly global crisis. So she was asking, has COVID-19 destroyed uh, globalization? Uh, and she went on to say this, that it hasn't killed globalization, but it has made the world a far more dangerous place and changed how we work and think internationally. Uh, she said that uh, uh, that it it is making international cooperation and global goods even harder than it was before. Uh, it's uh, that it has ki killed the instinct at the individual business and state level to live, work and travel internationally, to trade across borders, to cooperate on tackling global challenges and pursuing, pursuing common goods. Um, and uh, so she said this, the UK as the incoming COP26 president hosting in partnership with Italy, will continue to press for greater ambition around the world to reduce emissions, to build resilience, and to cooperate and support each other in a green recovery. So we're starting to see the rhetoric now about what type of recovery they're actually looking to pursue. And of course, if you're in the type of business which doesn't fit the model of a green recovery, sustainable development and so on, your business will not be encouraged to recover at all. We've reported this in past UK column news programs that UK government spokespeople have made this statement or at least asking the question, do we want to restart any business that doesn't fit uh, in with the green recovery? So let's uh, move on to uh, uh, Sir Geoffrey Adams, who's British ambassador to Egypt. And he made a joint statement with the Italian ambassador to, to Egypt because Britain and Italy are co-hosting uh, COP26. And he said uh, this yesterday, as we recover from COVID-19, we have a rare opportunity to rebuild in a way that lays the foundation for sustainable, resilient and inclusive growth. The international community can and must unite to tackle the climate crisis. This is certainly being taken, of the least you can say is it is being taken advantage of in order to pursue uh, an economic policy which fits with the whole climate crisis narrative, uh, sustainability, Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. And didn't we talk about this in the early days of this crisis, my COVID coming together with climate change now coming together like a hand in glove. So they're, they're foisting this upon us right now uh, like it's some, you know, revelation that they've had because of the novel coronavirus when in fact this was already in the works. 
This was planned well in advance. You only need to go to the World Economic Forum's own website and look right now at their COVID action plan. And you can see that this wasn't just something that came up spontaneously because of the coronavirus. They have already architected this well in advance. No, absolutely. And if you're on the, while you're on the World Economic Forum website, go and look for the Great Reset. Uh, this is being fronted by Prince Charles for some reason. Uh, there's a, a little introductory video there, but you can see if you read the documentation that goes alongside that, it, this again is something which has not just been created in the last two months. There's been, this has been worked on for a long time. So we maintain, last thing I'll say is we've maintained that the crisis has been completely overblown. The threat has been completely overblown and adopted by a number of countries led by the United States and the UK globally for that agenda. Of course, China is also on board with this as well. And so if it's overblown, if there's no real threat uh, compared to other well-known infectious diseases, Mike, yet all of this regulations coming in, all of these things have been shut down. Mm -hmm. They're blaming the co coronavirus. It's not the coronavirus that shut economies down. It's governments. It's governments. It's policy. Important to make that distinction. Uh, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, the latest global financial stability report has been released by the International Monetary Fund. This feeds into this uh, subject quite nicely. Uh, and what are they saying here? The pandemic could crystallize other financial vulnerabilities that have built up over the past decade. Because, Patrick, one of the issues here is that many of the, the, the problems which the green uh, a new green economy and uh, is, is designed to, to improve or to fix our problems that have existed for a very long time, particularly with the financial system. Um, so uh, what are they saying in this? Uh, they're saying that in advanced and emerging market economies alike, corporate and household debt burdens could become unmanageable for some borrowers in a severe economic contraction. Now, of course, they're acknowledging that there is going to be an economic contraction. Uh, and in fact, uh, in it, they, they've updated their April forecast on this uh, when they said there would be a 3% decline in world GDP. Uh, they're now saying that that's going to be 4.9%. They're saying that France, Italy and Spain are now going to have uh, collapses in their GDP of over 12%, the UK over 10%, Germany and the United States uh, around 8%, Russia 7%, down GDP, Japan 6%, and China will ha actually have positive growth, but 1% rather than China's more recent years around the 12-15% mark. So that's, that's the levels that we're at. Uh, and they're saying that, uh, that the data suggests even deeper downturns than previously uh, projected. Um, so there clearly is going to be a severe economic contraction. And they're saying here that debt burdens are going to become unmanageable uh, for uh, corporates and households. Of course, if you've got corporate debt uh, becoming unmanageable, you've got more companies going out of business, you've got people therefore being laid off, it very quickly becomes a spiral. Uh, a death spiral in effect. Uh, they say second insolvencies will test the resilience of the banking sector. Uh, not convinced that the banking sector actually has any resilience, so that's another potential problem. Third, non-bank financial companies and markets may face further stress, uh, and they'll be including hedge funds in this kind of thing, pension funds, uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and fourth, some emerging and frontier markets are facing high external refinancing requirements. So what that means is uh, there's a recognition that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, so-called emerging economies are going to have, uh, that already have a fairly high debt burden, are going to have to refinance that debt burden. But the, the refinancing that's going to be available is going to be much more expensive than it was before. Uh, and so that's going to put an even greater debt burden on countries that can really can't afford any kind of debt burden in any case. I think what we're seeing, Mike, is um, on all tiers, from the top financial tier, the elite tier, right down to the sort of mid-majors, down to the smaller businesses, those who can afford to comply or who are able to receive sufficient bailouts, they'll survive. Those who can't will go to the wall and be bought up for pennies on the dollar. We mm -hmm. also said this in the first days of this crisis. So a total consolidation of power, eliminating competition, killing off independence, whether they be banks or businesses, 
and where people with scale can afford to comply or can afford to survive, they will then capitalize on the new green economy going forward. Uh, so the question in the chat box, is this another plan? And it absolutely is another plan because if you've listened to what, when we've reported on this several times, Mark Carney, for example, recently uh, resigned or, or his ter term as governor of the Bank of England finished. But in the months leading up to the end of his term as governor of the Bank of England was making it absolutely clear that any company, any financial institution, uh, any organization which did not fit the green economic model would have credit cut off. He said they would go to the wall, they would become bankrupt, they would be made bankrupt by the banking system. And he even included banks that offered credit to companies that don't fit this model. Mm. This is a policy decision to, to re-architect the global economy on the green agenda lines. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, it absolutely is a, a plan. Green fascism is basically what absolutely. it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's come back to, to the first uh, uh, item of the day, PM warns of new lockdown after more than 500,000 swarmed to beaches. Uh, well, this is an interesting figure because the Office for National Statistics has just reported that just by coincidence, 500,000 people have been removed from the uh, from the furlough scheme um, since uh, the lockdown was partially lifted and the economy started to restart again. So 5,000 people, 500,000 people uh, not uh, on the furlough scheme anymore, back in their jobs, but perhaps they just took a day to, to have one final day of holiday before they went back to work. Um, but I thought we would just uh, we would just have a look and see what that, some context on that figure and see if we can work out uh, whether that's significant or not. Well, let's look at the number of people that have been furloughed since the 20th of April here. Uh, and what we can see is that at its peak uh, a week or so ago, it was 9.1 million people Mm -hmm. in this country on the furlough scheme. So 500,000 people having come off that in the last two weeks is not massively significant, Patrick. That only leaves 8.6 million people still furloughed. And how many of those jobs are actually going to come back? Uh, I think that's a very big question. Some commentators expecting us to end up with something in the region of 4 million unemployed. I think taking all this uh, into consideration, if it's that few, we'll be very lucky. We'll be very lucky. I think that's hugely underestimated. Same in America, the numbers are still growing. Uh, started with the 30 million figure that shocked everybody in terms of US unemployment. Then it became 40 million. And now I just spoke to somebody who was just, uh, just taking odds from a, a bookie on whether there's going to be 60 million by September. Mm. Uh, so there's people actually speculating on this now. So who knows? where the uh, ripple effects are going to end on this economic crash. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to say thank you to the uh, the viewer who sent me or the tip off on this. Uh, but this is commodity.com. UK trade is gold and despite Brexit fears, gold still tops import, um, the import and export list. So this was published uh, on the 8th of June. Uh, but there was something that was quite interesting on this when you when we looked at the uh, at the report uh, and they were talking about other notable imports uh, in the UK, and it's the last item on that list that I thought was really interesting. Patrick, human and animal blood, uh, $10 billion worth of imports into the UK on human and animal blood. And I'm asking, well, what is this about? Um, so let's have a look at how this uh, has gone over the last number of years. So this is since 2001, uh, and this is in uh, millions. So uh, as we can see, it peaked. Uh, th these, this particular data only goes up to 2018, uh, but it peaked there at around 9 uh, billion or so in 2018, 2017, came down off the 9 billion in 2018. As we now know, in 2020, it's back up to 10 billion. What is this uh, about? Well, maybe this gives us a clue. Human blood, animal blood prepared for therapeutic, prophylactic and diagnosis uses. Uh, also for uh, developing vaccines and so on, use in vaccines and so on. Um, this is what it's about. But what's really surprising, Patrick, is why we are importing this level of, of blood. Uh, because during the, uh, when they were preparing documents for Brexit, uh, this guidance note came out. Now, this guidance note uh, was withdrawn on the 3rd of March. Um, but the guidance notes is all about ensuring blood and blood products are safe if there is no Brexit deal. Uh, and this is what it says. 
the UK is largely self-sufficient in the supply of blood and blood components. If that were true, why are we importing $10 billion worth of blood products every year? Now, this is massive business. Uh, the USA imports $37 billion worth. That's 19.8% of the world's imports. Germany, 24 billion, that's 13%. Belgium, 18.4 billion, that's 10% roughly. Switzerland's next at 9.94 billion. Italy at 9.45 billion. Uh, and the UK, well, those are the 2018 figures. I don't have the 2020 figures for those other countries, but the UK obviously at 10 billion at the moment. So um, I don't know what the answer is to this. I don't know exactly what, the, what that, those blood products are being used for, uh, probably for scientific research, for development of vaccines, for the manufacturing of vaccines and this type of thing. But the scale of it, I was just somewhat surprised about. So if anybody can offer any assistance, it would be much appreciated. And two questions is, where is this coming from? And where is it going? And, and why can't countries uh, produce this domestically if there's such a huge import? Those would be my two questions. Well, well, one of the thing that's, things that's absolutely clear, Patrick, is obviously countries are producing it domestically and then they're exporting it to each other. Mm. So is there some kind of scientific reason why people want to experiment with blood from other countries? Uh, countries, is it is it about weapons development? What what I mean? Uh, there, there's uh, there's a hundred questions come up on this, and I don't have any answers at the moment. How much is coming from war theaters? That's something off to the side. Uh, not not a conspiracy, by the way. Uh, That's absolutely. actually a true query. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, right. Um, we will just uh, just bring this on screen now. This is Frederick Forsyth's article in the Express today. Don't leave veterans' fit. To the jobs worth, says F F uh, Frederick Forsyth. Um, and uh, well, he's talking about uh, uh, Dennis uh, Hutchings, for example. We've mentioned him on the program a couple of weeks ago, who's being prosecuted for an incident which happened in Northern Ireland a very long time ago. Uh, this is a 70 79 year old. He's got uh, significant health problems, uh, but he's being pursued by the, uh, uh, by the British government on this. Uh, now, this is despite the fact that he had received a letter from the Department of Public Prosecutions at the time that he had no case to answer. And it's also despite the fact that, uh, you know, from on the IRA side, whenever they uh, were facing uh, legal uh, charges based on, on that particular conflict, uh, they have uh, not suffered the same historical uh, sort of pursuance by the by the authorities. So anyway, Forsyth here making the point that in fact, it looks like or at least there's a hint that the British government is going to reverse its decision that Hutchins will have to sit in front of a, a judge only with no jury on this and that there may be a jury in his case, uh, which is going to be heard next February. Now, um, he then goes on to attack Johnny Mercer for not uh, offering any support to the veterans that are being pursued for these uh, uh, allegations. Uh, Johnny Mercer, of course, the Veterans Minister, so he, you would have expected him to uh, to offer them some support, but apparently not. Uh, but this was the bit that uh, was of interest to me. Uh, there must be a lot of us who once wore the uniform and carried the blue passport with some pride, who are very fed up with Blondie's handover of us all to the tender mercies of an invisible and ruthless bureaucracy. So uh, Blondie, of course, is uh, uh, our illustrious leader. Alan Johnson. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, But uh, what is this ruthless bureaucracy that he's talking about? Is he talking about the legal system, perhaps? But he's also perhaps hinting at the uh, bureaucracy that we've been talking about for quite a long time, now headed up by Mark Sedwell. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that Mark Sedwell, not a very happy bunny at the moment. He may be in charge of all this infrastructure and apparently king of the country, uh, but he is being pursued. Uh, and uh, the Financial Times now... Finally, this has broken into the mainstream press. We've been uh, talking about it for a couple of weeks that there seems to be this massive spat going on within Whitehall. Uh, the Financial Times talking about it. Civil Service Chief's future in doubt as Boris Johnson eyes Whitehall shake up. And the, uh, the, the Financial Times here absolutely making the point that Dominic Cummings is working very hard to get Sedwell out of his job. Now, we've made the point many times that Sedwell's position is unprecedented in the history of this com com country that one man is head of the civil service, head of the cabinet office, and head of the National Security Agency, uh, sorry, National Security Council. And at the same time, this is an un unprecedented level of, of power in the hands of one man. And Cummings clearly unhappy about that. And it, the, the Times absolutely making it clear 
that uh, the restructuring of the civil service that, that Dominic Cummings has been working towards for quite some time now will also include Mark Sedwell's head. Um, I don't think that's <laughs> a, a bad situation. Proverbially. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, we hope Figuratively. So. Figuratively, yeah. we presume. Well, f firstly, I want to say it's great to see the Financial Times is watching the UK column di diligently so they're getting, they know where they're getting their stories from. But uh, Mike, isn't the fundamental issue here is this battle between power in the cabinet office, the sort of the grey power in the cabinet office and uh, ministerial power or government power from the House of Commons. And so when did this start? This started under Tony Blair. It did, yes. This restructuring. Yes. That's the fundamental battle going on, isn't it? It, it seems to have come to a head at this stage. It has, it has been accepted since Tony Blair up until the last couple of years. And, and increasingly as, because Sedwell's position was only ever supposed to be a, a temporary position, as he has held on to that power, uh, more and more people starting to ask questions and uh, well once uh, Boris Johnson became Prime Minister he brought some people in with them including Cummings they're clearly deeply unhappy with that situation and they see it needs to be changed right now we're just going to quickly end on this Patrick because on Wednesday we we're making the point about the uh, the start treaty talks uh, the new start treaty talks which have been taking place in Vienna uh, and the fact that the United States baiting China uh, China no intention of taking part in these talks, but the United States trying to draw them in for whatever reason, uh, a reason known only to themselves. Um, and they even had positions at the table for the Chinese who clearly had already stated that they weren't going to go. Uh, well, the uh, Secretary of State for Defence, uh, Mark Esper, is uh, uh, in Brussels today to meet Jens Stoltenberg at NATO headquarters and they give a press release. Uh, and uh, well, this is what they said. Uh, this is what the press release said. Jens Stoltenberg and Secretary Esper agreed that China, as a rising global power, has a responsibility to take part in global arms control. In other words, those seats need to be occupied as far as they're concerned. Uh, but this is really just China baiting, as far as I can see. So they're, they're, they're trying to strong arm China into these um, uh, bilateral uh, arms negotiations, Mike, and China is saying that uh, this has nothing to do with us. Mm. Go ahead and do your thing with Russia. Don't drag us into it. But what they're attempting to do, Mike, I think, is they want China in because then they'll be able to pull Iran in as well. Mm. And that's the, probably the U.S.'s number one objective is to fold Iran into some of these uh, missile uh, restriction uh, treaties so that they don't have uh, sh at least short or medium-term uh, missile capabilities in the Middle East. Of course, we all know who's calling those shots mm. to the United States. That's Israel's special request to Washington. So, But they'll need China to do that because China and Iran are, are very close. And uh, if, if China comes in, they might be able to influence with Russia uh, some kind of Iranian cooperation. Doesn't look like it's going to happen right now. No, indeed. Well, look, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you very much, Patrick, for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you have a great weekend. Uh, don't be silly on the beaches. And uh, enjoy yourselves. We'll see you at mon um, Monday at 1 p.m. Stay safe. Stay safe. Control the virus. Absolutely. Have fun at the beach. Bye-bye.